with my friend Ralph, and we're going to recreate the gospel lesson today that the pastor is going to be here today. And it's about Jesus in the temple who's preaching and, it's, and a man who's possessed by a demon. We're going to see what happens. So I'm going to play the role of Jesus, and Ralph is going to be the man who does, right? in the temple, and he's saying stuff like, oh, you know, love your neighbor, don't steal, be good, and all the people are listening to him, and then there's a man there, and he's possessed by a demon. Over here, my teeth still, he's doing all these bad things, and he's possessed, and Jesus says, you should be doing that, he's like, you can't tell me what to do. I have a demon in me and I can't do what I want to do. And Jesus says, oh yeah. Jesus puts his hand on me and goes, Demon, be gone. And the man says, I feel better. I feel better. Jesus says, your demon is gone. And the man says, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> and all the people that saw that were amazed. They said, this man Jesus has so much power. He can even cast out demons. Huh? He can cast out demons to anybody. He is great. And so since that, from that day on, the word spread that Jesus was a very powerful and special person. Now, today, I can't cast out demons. Jesus didn't give me that power. But he gave me the power to do lots of things. Didn't he, Ralph? No, 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 I can do, I have the power to make people happy. Yeah, see, it worked. Woo! I have the power to make people smile. Woo, it worked again. See, I don't have to cast out demons to do what Jesus wants to do. Huh. And we all have that power to do. Jesus gave all of us that power. We don't have to make big decisions and do great things. Sometimes it's just the small things that make a difference in somebody's life. You just be a friend to somebody. You can be nice to your neighbor. You can help other people. That's what Jesus wants us to do. Isn't that right, bro? Look, look. Look, 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 look. So if you go out today, and always, let's remember that Jesus gave us the power to do many great things, no matter how small those things we see. So, when we go out today, let's remember that Jesus loves us. He's going to be with us all the time, helping us to do all the things that he wants us to do. Do we say a little prayer? Do we say a prayer, right? Yeah. Ralph is going to say the prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power that you have given us. We thank you for the opportunity to share those powers with everybody that we come in contact with. May every day be a special day. In your name we pray. Amen. first reading in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. 
The Lord your God will raise you up for you, for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall be such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Erech on the day of the assembly when he said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore or ever again see his great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up from them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Today we will read Psalm 111 responsibly. If you turn to your hymnal, you will have a red tab there and find Psalm 111. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. You send redemption to your people and command your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. Today's second reading is from the 8th chapter of the Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrifices to idols, we know that all of us do this knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by Him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as in fact there are many gods in many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now. They still think of the food they eat as food offered to the idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food and sacrifice to the idol? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you, th but when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against them. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord.
They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the temple and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as one of the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. But 
But suddenly our tranquil and inviting time is of learning and teaching is broken. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. Holy one of God. Comes this raspy, awful voice from the back of Hughes. It's no comment on who's sitting in the back. <laughs> we look amongst each other. That's new. Ah, that doesn't happen in worship. As we turn to look to the back doors, our anxieties go through the roof. Our stomachs turn within themselves. The one who is shrieking has this twisted face. His body is contorted. And his eyes, they scream like they are piercing with pain and anger. But when we look back to Jesus, scroll still in his hand like a good Baptist pastor, <laughs> his face isn't worried. His body isn't bothered. He is focused and uniquely prepared. He shouts back, be quiet! A welcome response from everyone else sitting in the synagogue. We're just glad someone else said it and not us. But Jesus isn't done. And his words are so unexpected and completely out of the ordinary that each of us are rocked to our core. Come out of it, he says. And with one final ear-piercing shriek, the possessed man falls to the floor in a heap of exercise relief. We can't believe what is just happening in front of us. Our attention moves back and forth like a pendulum between the man on the floor and Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Who is this guy from Nazareth? How and by whose authority does he do such things? We begin to ask ourselves in wonder. As God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ stands as the incarnate incarnation of God in our world, here to upset the status quo and usher in a new way of seeing and experiencing love and grace. It is by His authority that the oppressive spirits, the evils in the world, are overturned and replaced by God's love. And it is in that moment of overturning that they are simultaneously realized and are forced to remember that God's reign is supreme. It is by His command that every knee will bend and every head will bow at the promise of new life that has been won for our sake. And it is by his word of love and grace that the kingdom of God and God's reign on earth takes hold. This means that no longer will curtains and veils separate God from God's people. But rather the grace and love of God will be as close to us as the tip of our own nose. No longer will strife or warfare, <coughs> racial prejudices or hatred separate the people of God from one another. But all will be joined together as one body of Christ, sent in faith to share God's love. No longer are churches to act alone for the sake of themselves, but are to give of themselves freely for the one who gave himself for us. <laughs> These exorcism texts are often hard and come to us very differently almost with a different aura around them. But they in turn offer us a glimpse of something much greater. These texts, especially in the Gospel of Mark, are a way of underlining, bolding, and putting into italics the answer to the question, who is this Jesus? He is the one who has come for the sake of the world. He is the one who has come to usher in new life. He is God incarnate for the sake of the world, even for those church people who can't find a place to fit in in their own church. And Jesus has come to institute the kingdom of God. Mark depicts Jesus as the uniquely authorized, commissioned, or empowered 
to declare and institute the reign of God. Writes Matt Skinner. Through Jesus, then, we glimpse characteristics of what that reign is to look like. It is intrusive. It is breaking of the old barriers and boundaries that benefited an old kind of rule. It is about liberating people from the powers that afflict them and keep all creation, including human bodies and human societies, from flourishing. By the authority of Jesus Christ, life is made new. Second chances are given as gifts of grace. And you and I are called to live in, with, and through that grace. <clears throat> we are challenged by this message not to assume that the way things are must be the way things have to be. Why? Because we are free from what binds us in this world. Evil, sin, and the devil, and death. And we are commissioned and driven from this place of worship to accompany Christ and to share that good news of God's reign with the world and all the rest. It is with every single stride that we take when we come to the altar of our Lord for baptism, prayer, for communion, for giving of our offerings and tithes, that we are reminded that it is us, it is you, and it is I, that are made new by the power, authority, and grace of Jesus Christ. Walk in that love. Treasure that grace. And go from this place forevermore with the knowledge that you take with you the promise that you are a part of what God is up to right now. <clears throat> you, in everything you are called to do, are a part of God's kingdom. Come. Amen.